commonly known as drones flying over the cities and all these things. That was about two projects of mine I did in the past. And some conclusions. Then I will talk about Count Chapelier. This is just because of my experience with archaeologists in Europe. They don't know how it works and they don't know what shall they buy the satellite data, what is fantastic, what is the resolution of, and things like that. So I'm going through that. If you know how it works, we also made it scratch this one. And then I'm, I'm talking at the end about the European Remote Sensing Program. So I'm from Germany and I'm a European, so I'm talking about the newest developments in Europe. I could also talk about the United States or something else, but it's a lot going on in the European countries. So, starting with all the history. <coughs> in the 18th century, they had balloons. You know, when they first got the camera, <coughs> this was about 1835. The camera was invented, and then they started with the balloon in France, and they took the camera over here, you see, and made some pictures on the earth. The German engineer took some doves, pigeons, and on front of the pigeons he put a camera. You may see that over here. It's hardly to, to recognize because it's very old, very old photos. It's not. It's not the best quality, for example. And when we started with the aeroplanes in the beginning of the 90s, 1900, 1910, 1920, around the First World War, uh, we took some cameras into the aeroplane and made some pictures, especially for the military purposes. In 1972, over here, there was a very first satellite called Landsat 1 for commercial uses. And then it went on and down, and this is a double, uh, a double satellite photo. Here's one satellite, and here's another one. This is especially called Terrasa, Terrasa X and Tandem X German project. And they capture the Earth, especially the type of the Earth, the whole Earth. And 10 years ago, or even more, we are not cartographing the Earth by itself. We are also flying to the Moon, to the Mars, to other, the <coughs> to other the, the, in the, the universe, and make some pictures of these countries and make some very nice maps. Something more about the history. <clears throat> Maybe you have heard about the Corona project. The Corona project was in the, in the 60s and went up to the 70s, the end of the 70s. It was, it was totally military, totally military project. And Anyway, that was the first photo from a satellite with panorama cameras and things like that. And they operated from 60 to 72, and it was declassified in the first time in 1995. Because it was military pictures, military photos, the United States, it's from the United States, they declassified it in 1995. And 2000 and 2005. So we can we can use these pictures. I show you later on one example of the Corona, and we will be uh, astonished about it because of its its, its resolution. Then we have the first steps at one in 72. Four bands resettled resettled to 60 meters in resolution, free of charge. Then we have lens at eight in 2013. 11 bands, you see here is 4 bands, here is 11, we have resolution of 15 meters phantomatic and 30 meters multispectral and 100 meter in the thermal, thermal environment. 
then one example of it was the first one, Iconos, the first one which we called high resolution satellite. satellite. High resolution satellite. But then there followed other ones, GOI, Greek World, IRS, Indian One, Worldview, etc. And today we have on the market a lot of very high resolution satellites. So this is an example of Corona. <coughs> it's for free. You can get it for free. And this is uh, this was done in 1968. Corona was a project you have to consider when we had the Cold War. The Cold War in between the West, US and its alliance, and the East in Russia. And this and that's why the Americans they had this Corona project and they flew over the Russian countries to make some nice pictures. And uh, you probably can also get Corona data from Chokja Cup. You just want to have a look. But it's not so easy because it's, it's, it's uh, very strange photos. We, uh, yeah, we georeference already these old data with the new data. And, but uh, just look about the, well, I have the feeling about this Corona picture, military one in 1968, because In 1972, when Lancet started, it's Lancet 1, Lancet 2, up to 11 now, but Lancet 1, 2, 3, they only had four bands and had a 60, 70 meters resolution of hers. This is the same size of Albir. Albir is a city in the Iraq. The same size.
program which is running all over the world. The multi spectral we have here, we have today up to maybe 15 different spectral channels or bands, separate ones, and with the uh, hyperspectral, we are going at the moment for aeroplanes up to 250 small spectral channels. But as far as I know, it's only in only working in aeroplanes. It's not very good working in satellites. That's still testing. Maybe you know more about it. I did not work up to this time with other spectral data. So, I have some uh, archaeological projects in the past three or five years in different countries. And uh, I want to show you, uh, talk about the objective of the ETM of the town in Aviel. They wanted to have uh, the DTM better than one meter in height, 50 centimeters on the ground resolution. So I used the stereo data of the Jayat satellite and uh, the archaeologists wanted to have the contour lines of the city. So first I started the inquiry because the playout data are not for free. If you, if you want to have a, an archived playout data, for example, what I did in this case, uh, it costs you about $30 per square kilometer. $30 per square kilometer. But you have to buy at least 50 square kilometers. So you cannot buy one or two. Yeah. The, 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 the mayor of Erbil asked me, I oh, only want to have two square kilometers. That's, that's only 60 US dollars. I cannot afford this. But then I told him you have to buy it at least 50. So it has to be more expensive. In Germany we have a company, DAFAG, uh, they are working together with the United States. You can get any any satellite data you want, then you have to, to order this. And this is the one I ordered for the, the, the archaeologist paid for it. It was, they wanted to have 5 by 5 kilometers. So this is here, 5 by 5 kilometers. The Pleiad, they are flying in one orbit, 180 degree apart. So they have, they are able to use uh, each point on Earth twice a day, like this one, about 700 kilometers above Earth. And this, this picture here, this image is recorded in 2013. We have the spectral lens RGB and via infrared and also the panchromatic one. The panchromatic one is actually captured with 0.7 meters but they resemble it to 50 centimeter. Sometimes you see the difference. It's really, uh, uh, you can recognize that. And the multispectral data is captured this 2.7 meters, and they resemble it to 2 meters. So you have four time pixels for one MS pixel. And this is the five times five. And uh, with this stereo, we got the DTM, the all made in Airbus matching, if you know it. And from the DTM, we is easily to calculate the contour lines. As you can see, and if you see these contour lines over here, it's 50 centimeter, I think. You realize directly the citadel you have seen in the stereo picture, which come out from it. That was the result. I have another archaeological project in Kiraya, in the northwest of Saudi Arabia. The uh, University of Vienna in Austria, they, also, they wanted to have a GPS network for the archaeological program over there, so I had to determine the GPS basic network. I called for them the TOI1 data also 50 centimeter or 50 or 
60, something like that. And we had to store all the data, especially the excavation areas. We excavated it uh, in a GIS. And uh, the university is using the open source GIS QGIS. We have, used, we have to use the UTM coordinate system, which causes mostly some trouble if somebody doesn't know how it works. Because it's, not, it's easy, but it's easy for people from the geodesy like me, but for other disciplines it might be somehow difficult to understand. <clears throat> and then we made some topographical maps for future tasks which is not yet ready, this program is still running. And I have a couple of students working with bachelor thesis and master thesis in these projects. Here you see my measurements of the whole area. Actually, this is the excavation area where they want to start. They started over here and they want to work year by year. Not so easy to go to South, South Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia, sorry. <laughs> and I have also to take some uh, ground control points in order to geo-reference the whole scene. And you see somewhere here is the other points, and here is one, and here is one. It was my most difficult, my most difficult area to find ground control points for satellite data. Because you have to find points on the Earth which can be seen in the satellite image. This is a desert, it's not so easy to find such points. As you can see, here I didn't find anything. This is a farm. That's hard to go over there, they don't allow you to enter this farm. So here are some houses, but I was not able to measure over there. What's so the hell? Which rather is the ones I realized. <coughs> Here on the excavation area, I didn't connect the points, but here you see, for example, on this little one, four corners, four points. And the, if you know as the, uh, like the uh, archaeologists working, they have the four points, then they put some, some yeah, and, keep it and measure it and that's the total station if they find the shirt it's measured 3D and things like that. All this data we put in our database. And we can map it, we can map it here in the satellite data. <coughs> so now I want to come to the photogrammetry, the digital photogrammetry in terms of UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles all the drones. Well, digital photogrammetry, when I was working at the university in Berlin, for example, in Germany, that was the end of 70s, beginning of the 80s, we started to replace the analog photogrammetry stations with the digital in the 80s, last century. But it was not an easy task. Anyhow, the image geometry is one of totally mathematical. You don't need to speak deep looking at the visual. The analog images are replaced by digital images. So we had a bunch of analog photos, we all scanned them with a very high, high resolution scanner to make it digital. Practical applications are more sophisticated because of the mathematics you have to use. But we have a much deeper automation of the measurement. We can measure some things really automatically without checking it. <coughs> Let the system run for one night or two days and you hopefully get a good result. We had it in production very good up to the 90s. So I don't want you to understand all this. <coughs> it's, it looks a bit uh, mathematical and I think it's, it's, the, only, the only thing you got to know from this slide is we call it the interior orientation of, a, of one image, of one photo, of one digital photo. The digital photo is this one here. <coughs> the inner orientation 
to be always clean if you have a photo. If you want to work with <laughs> this, this photo is the focal length scene, you know, from your camera. The, you, hold, do you call it a focal lens? Yeah, focus. Focus. The position of the image focal point relative to the center of the of the uh, photo. The center of the photo is the intersection of this vertical and horizontal lines from the fiducial lines. This is this M. And the plumb line, for example, from the projection center to the, to the image. Here's a rectangle in this case. This is called the focal, the focal lines. I call it here C or F, whatever you want. <coughs> and these three things, uh, excuse me, from the, from the center of the picture to this point H, this vertical, which is called the distortion. This one here, these three things you have to know of each photo if you work with it. This is called the inner orientation. Sorry. Then we have another one, the exterior orientation. This is here the aeroplane, the game center of projection, the positive photo, here you have the ground point. And uh, if you work with all these things, you need to know the exterior orientation of each photo by an aeroplane, the coordinates of the projection centers X0, X0, Y0, Z0, which is this one here, X0, Y coordinate, UTM for example, and the rotation angles, omega phi kappa, are they called here also omega phi kappa? It's international somehow. And the rotation angles, the omega phi kappa, you see around this image coordinate systems. This X, Y, Z. And then if you talk about uh, vector algebra, it's, it's easy to get this point. You need this vector over here, xp, on the point on the earth you want to measure with this relation, but I don't go into it. It's just it's not that difficult, only a bit. So, how do you get all these things? Especially the exterior orientation, you get it by an aerial triangulation. Karl Kraus was professor of the University of Vienna, and he was working in this matter very, very long time, for a very long time. You have here your terrain, here are your photos on the plane, you have some ground control points over here, at least four in the four corners you need, but there is some more, of course. And then the uh, system, the digital system, finds the type points automatically and things like that. And then you get for each photo the exterior coordinates. So you know exactly where this photo was in the air. Then you can calculate whatever you want. Okay, flight planning you have to do. You see the flight planning. This is your area you want to measure. You goes like this. <coughs> have here and the minimum 60 cents over that and here the side depth of 20 to 30 uh, at the moment this digital we fly always 1990 so we have a lot of photos can be used to measure all these things we fly 1990 because it doesn't matter if you make thousand pictures digital or ten thousand but cost any more you only need space the time in uh, 50 years ago when we had the analog was another question. Yes. They knew always the minimum, the minimum, the minimum was 60% and 10%. And if something happens in the plane, the wind is coming, something, you got some gaps. Yeah. And in order to avoid it, we fly usually today in Germany every five years, every five years Germany has to be photographed, photogrammetric measure. 25 years by 1990. So UAP <coughs> are to be understood.
as uninhabited and reusable motorized aerial vehicles. I surprised the, 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 Swiss, the Swiss person, he, in his dissertation, he described it a bit more. You can read quite a lot of it. It's, it's a drone working pro program. Because once it crashes, 
if they hit somebody, yeah? Because a lot of the speeches in Germany, it's better go to somewhere else. <laughs> Decision farming. Yeah, decision farming. And therefore, we also had been 
measuring the GPS, ground control points, very accurate. And then they started to fly, and we had this uh, workflow over here. And uh, the uh, result was uh, what, we, what we also did was the calibration of the camera. The modern, the modern software you have today is uh, it's possible that you get all the calibration data of the camera out of the mathematics, out of the computing system. And we made the calibration of the camera before we flew and after the flight. Because we wanted to know has something changed in the camera to get rid of this. And then we had an automatic rectification and modulating with strong control points. And we had been using the light off of the planetary suite, which is a part of Airbus image. This is our calibration station in our university. You can see you have here a three-dimensional room like this one. And on each, on each side you have some special marks. And you, these special marks had been measured with the total station, very accurate. And then we took the pictures and we got the calibration of the camera. And the accuracy you can see here of the marks on the walls, it's 0.1 millimeter. 0.1 millimeter. You calculate all the other things. That's a photogrammetrical aerial flight. <coughs> on the left hand, the Anmobila project that was able to, to fly automatically. It was programmed automatically and then flow this direction and back in this direction. So this looks quite good for a UAV flight. Looks quite good. But you see the over the over the over then very much. Anyway something on the and then the little guys from the model club <coughs> just flying around with a drone have never been directed to go exactly this path. So they try to do a good job and you see how this looks like. Because sometimes they flew in this direction, sometimes in that direction, and you see that immediately on the shape of these photos. The uh, red triangles are the GCPs, ground control points. So we wait <coughs> the uh, yeah, we, we took our software and made the uh, results. <coughs> And the accuracy of the point measurements, average standard deviation of a measured ground control point is Andromeda, is the sigma x, y, z, is here about 2 decimeters. They had no ground control points, we had to take it from topographical maps. We, the, in the club, we use the, the GPS, and you see we are in the centimeter. After the triangulation of all this, we go down to almost a decimeter without ground, ground control points, and uh, centimeter level with control points. So it means with a drone, if you make it properly, you can get there. You can get a resolution of about one centimeter in size. To make it properly. And these are the mosaics. Left hand side from the Andromeda project, and right hand side uh, the model class with no graduation corrections, but it fixed very well. What you can see if you have a look over in this here, this is the, the Germany, we call it the Autobahn, the highway, only for cars. Maybe you see here a little, little bit of that. Yeah? Have you an idea why this, where this comes from? 
It's a bridge. Actually, it's a bridge for the valley. Because we had the wrong DTM. We had the wrong DTM in this class. We had, they didn't take the DTM of the bridge. They had the DTM of the ground. And then it worked nicely. But this is easy to correct. Anyways, the things have been very good. So the UAV <coughs> conclusions. They really have a tremendous potential for many applications. And if you go through the world today, everybody is talking about roads. Everybody is talking about roads. Cannot work. We have a high accuracy in the coordinates. The camera calibration at that time when we had been working with it was a must, because the results had been much better than without. Uh, but these days now we have, for example, the software called Agisoft. Agisoft is a Russian software for those drone areas and they also have a self-calibration. You can get it also from the software. The INU or the, <coughs> the INS, the INS and the INU, the measurements are still to be accurate because it's low cost systems and uh, you get an accuracy of not better than maybe 2 or 3 degree which is not enough and the UEB experts should understand the geodetic and photogrammetric specifications and vice versa this is always the best thing so we can talk to, together to solve this problem So the perspective, which is my opinion, in the future it will be forever an autonomous photogrammetric measurement tool. You have to have to think, you have to think about it and buy it now. The limiting factor for high accuracy are the integrated low-cost GPS and high uses. The low cost. GPS, you are not better than 5 meters, 3 to 5 meters, and the navigation system. The development of new features and methods are needed, so we have to have the processing of flexible flight tracks, flexible ones, not only going in the same directions, you can also cross, you get better results if you have different directions. It's solved already these days. We just recently in September we had been uh, we had been working on a project in South America and this this drone was flying in each direction you wanted to have. The improvement of low cost should will come, I'm sure. And uh, what is not really yet fixed is the implementation of differential GPS. Differential GPS I have seen some examples in another university in Germany, they started with a differential GPS. They put a master on the airplane, on the where you are, you fly, and have a GPS in the plane, and then 